Chapter 12 Dale's bleak report brought an immediate reaction. Minion leaped to his feet, reaching for his sword and threatening to fight his way out or die in the attempt. Bellinor tried to restrain him, or at least to quiet him. But there was complete bedlam for several minutes as the others joined the shouting Highlander in his vow. And all questioned the somewhat shaken Dale about what he had seen at the entrance of the pass. And after a few brief questions, loudly ordered everyone to be silent. The name chieftains are out there, he informed Bellinor, who had finally managed to restrain Minion long enough to listen to the dwarf. They have all the high priests and members of surrounding villages here for a special ceremony that takes place once each month. They come at sunset and sing praises to their gods for protecting them from the evils of the taboo land, the wolf's cat. It will last all night, and by morning, we can forget about helping our young friends. <laughs> Wonderful people, the gnomes, exploded Minion. They fear the evils of this place, but they align themselves with the wall of war. I don't know about the rest of you. But I'm not giving up because of a few half-wit gnomes chanting useless spells. No one is giving up, men. Bellinor said quickly. We're getting out of these mountains tonight. Right now. How do you propose to do that? Demanded Hendel. Walk right through our th gnome nation or perhaps we'll fly out. For a minute. Minion exclaimed suddenly and leaned over the unconscious shade searching eagerly through his clothing until he produced a small leather pouch containing the powerful elf stones. <laughs> the elf stones will get us out of here, he announced to the other, grasping the pouch. Has he lost his mind? asked Hendel, incredulous at the sight of the Highlander, eagerly waving the leather pouch. It won't work, Minion, declared Balinor quietly. The only one with the power to use a stone is Shay. Besides, Eleanor once told me they could only be used against things whose power lies beyond substance. Dangers that confuse the mind. Those gnomes are mortal flesh and blood, not creatures of the spirit world or the imagination. I don't know what you're talking about, but I do know that these stones worked against that creature from the Mismarsh. I swear it'll work, Minion trailed off despondently, reflecting on what he was saying and finally lowered the pouch and its precious contents. What's the use? You must be right. I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. There has to be a way, Durin came forward, casting about for suggestions. All we need is a plan to draw attention away from us for about five minutes. And we could slip by them. Minion perked up the suggestion, apparently finding some merit in the idea, but unable to think of a way to distract the attention of several thousand gnomes. Balinor paced about for a few minutes, lost in the thought while the others threw out random suggestions. Handel suggested in bitter humour that he could walk into their midst and let himself be captured. The gnomes would be so overjoyed at getting their hands on him the man they had tried so hard to destroy all these years that they would forget about anything else. Minion thought little of the joke and was all for allowing him to do what he suggested. Oh, enough talk, roared the Prince of Lee, finally, losing his temper altogether. All we need now is a plan, one that will get us out of here right away, before the Valmen are completely beyond help. Now what do we do? How wide is the pass? asked Balinor absently, still pacing. About two hundred yards at the point the gnomes are gathered. Dale replied, avoiding a confrontation with Minion. He thought a minute longer and then snapped his fingers in recollection. The right side of the pass is completely open, but on the left side there are small trees and shrubs growing along the cliff face. They would give us some cover. Not enough, interrupted Hendel. The pass of Jade is wide enough to march an army through. 
but trying to get past with a little cover off it would be suicidal. I've seen it from the other side, and any gnome looking would spot you in a minute. Then they'll have to be looking somewhere else, Bellinor growled as a faint glimmer of a plan began to form in his mind. He stopped suddenly, and kneeling on the forest floor, drew a crude diagram of the past entrance, looking to Dayal and Hendel for approval. Minion had stopped complaining long enough to join them. From the drawing it appears that we can stay under cover and out of the light until we reach here, Bellinor explained, indicating a point of ground near the line representing the left cliff face. The slope is gentle enough to allow us to remain above the gnome and within the cover of the brush. Then there is an open space for about 25 or 30 yards until the forest begin against a steeper cliff face beyond. That is the point of diversion. The point where the light will show us clearly to anyone looking. The gnomes will have to be turned another way when we cross that open space. He paused and looked at the four ancient faces, wishing fervently that he had a better plan, but knowing that there was no time to come up with another if they were to preserve any chance of recovering the sword of Shannara. Whatever else was at stake now, nothing was of such paramount importance as the light of the frail-looking Valman who was heir to the sword's power, and the one chance left to the people of the Four Lands to avoid a conflict that would consume them all. Their lone lives could be sold comparatively cheaply to preserve that single hope. It will take the best bowmen in the Southland. The borderman announced quietly. A man will have to be Minion Lee. The Highlander looked up in surprise at the unexpected declaration. Unable to hide the sense of pride he felt. There will be only one shot, continued the Prince of Calhoun. If it is not exactly on target, we will be lost. What is your plan? interrupted Durin curiously. When we reach the end of our cover at the open space, Minion will locate one of the known chieftains to the far side of the pass. He will have one shot for the bow to kill him, and in the confusion that follows, we can slip by. Yeah, it won't work, my friend, growled Hednall. The minute they see their leader struck by the arrow, they'll be all over this pass entrance. You'll be found in minutes. Bellinor shook his head and smiled faintly, but unconvincingly. No, we won't, because they will be after someone else. The minute the known chieftain falls, one of us will show himself back in the pass. The gnomes will be so incensed and so eager to get their hands on him that they won't take the time to search for anyone else, and we can slip by in the confusion. Silence greeted as the appraisal of the situation, and the anxious faces looked from one person to the next, the same thought in every mind. It sounds just fine for everyone, but the man who stays behind to show himself, broken minion in disbelief, who gets that suicidal chore? It was my plan, declared Bellinor. It will be my duty to stay behind and lead the gnomes into the wolf cave until I can circle back and join you later at the edge of the Anna. You must be insane if you think I'm letting you stay behind and claim all the credit, Minion declared. If I make the shot, I stay to take the bows, and if I miss, he trailed off and smiled, shrugging casually, clapping Duran on the shoulder as the other one looked on incredulously. Balinor was about to object further when Hendel stepped forward, shaking his broad head in disagreement. Blan is fine as it goes, but we all know that the man who stays behind will have several thousand gnomes attempting to drag him down, who at best, waiting for him to come out of their taboo land. The man who stays must be a man who knows the gnomes their methods, how to fight and survive against them, 
In this case, that man is a dwarf with a lifetime of battle knowledge behind him. There must be me. Besides, he added grimly, I told you how badly they wanted my head. They won't pass up the chance after such an affront. I've already told you, insisted Minion again. That's mine. Handel is right, Balinor cut in sharply. The others looked at him in amazement. Only Handel knew that the decision the Borderman had made, however distasteful, was the same one who would have made had their positions been reversed. The choice has been made, and we will abide by it. Handel had the best chance to survive. He turned to the stocky dwarf warrior and extended a broad hand. The other gripped it tightly for a brief moment, then turned quickly from them and disappeared up the trail at the slow trot. The others watched, but he was gone in a matter of seconds. The booming of the drums and the chanting of the gnomes rolled deeply out of the lighted sky to the west. Gag the Velmen so they cannot cry out ordered Balinor, startling the other three with the sharpness and the sudden command. The minion failed to move, but remained rooted to the spot, looking silently up the path Handel had taken a moment before. Balinor turned to him and placed a reassuring hand on his shoulder. Be certain, Prince of Lee, that your shot is worthy of his sacrifice for us. The still twisting bodies of the two Valmen were quickly secured to the makeshift creatures and their low cries effectively muffled by tightly bound cloth kegs. The four remaining men picked up their gear from the stretches and moved out of the cover of the trees toward the mouth of the path, said Jay. Their own fires blazed up before them, lighting the night sky in a brilliant aura of yellow and orange flame. The drums crashed out in steady rhythm, the sound deafening in the ears of the four as they drew closer. The chanting grew louder until it seemed as if the entire gnome nation must be gathered. The overall sensation was one of eerie unreality, as if they were lost in that primitive world of half dreams, traversed by mortal and spirit alike in a strange ritual that have no recognisable purpose. The walls of the towering cliff rose jaggedly into the night sky on either side, distant but ominously huge intruders on the little scene taking place at the high entrance to the Pass of Jade. Rock walls glimmered in a shower of colour. Red, orange and yellow blended into an overriding deep green that danced and flicked in the man-made firelight. The colour reflected off the hardness of the rock and mirrored softly in the grim set faces of the four stretcher bearers touching momentarily the fear they were trying to conceal. Finally, the men stood within the corridor of the pass, just out of the sight of the chanting gnomes. The slopes rose steeply on either side, the northern incline offering little or no cover whatsoever, while the southern barely bristled with small trees and dense shrub that grew so quickly it was choking on itself. Balan or silent, he signaled the others, to make their way up the side of the slope. He took the lead himself, searching out the safest approach, moving cautiously upward toward the small trees that grew higher on the mountain. It took them quite a while to reach the safety of the trees, and Balanors motioned them to slowly ahead into the mouth of the pass. As they entered forward, Minion could look through breaks in the trees and brush to catch quick glimpses of the fires burning below. Still ahead of them, their bright flames almost completely masked by the hundreds of small, gnarled figures who moved rhythmically in the light, chanting in a deep, soul-searching drone to the spirits of the wolf's gang. His mouth felt dry as he visualised what would happen to them if they were discovered, and he thought grimly of Handel, who was suddenly very afraid for the dwarf. The brush and trees began to thin out, rising higher on the slope, and the four crept upward under their cover, but slow now, more hesitantly, as Balinor kept one eye fixed on the gnomes below. J 
Juran and Dale walked on Cathy, their light elven frames moving soundlessly through dry, brittle limbs and twigs, blending into the natural terrain about them. Again, Minion peered worriedly at the gnome, closer than before, their yellowish bodies weaving the drums, gleaming with the sweat of hours spent calling on their gods and praying to the mountains. Then the four reached the end of their cover. Balinor pointed ahead to the yards of open space that lay between them, and the dense forest of the Anar, standing darkly beyond. It was a long distance, and there was nothing between the man and the floor of the pass but the shrub brush and a few sparse blades of grass dried from the sun. Directly below were the chanting gnomes, swaying in the fire's glow and in a perfect position to see anyone attempting to cross the brightly lighted open spaces of the southern slope. Dale had been correct. It would be suicide to attempt to sneak past under those conditions. Many looked up and quickly saw that further efforts to reach higher ground with the two wounded bowmen were effectively prevented by a sheer cliff face that rose abruptly several hundred feet into the air, banking only lightly as it continued upward to its invisible peak. He turned back to look again at the open space had appeared farther across than before. Eleanor motioned the others into a side circle. <laughs> Minion can move to the edge of the cover, he whispered cautiously. After he picks his target and the gnome is hit, Handel will focus their rage by calling attention to himself inside the pass, high on the other slope. He should be in a place by this time. When the gnomes rush him, we move across the open space as quickly as possible. Don't stop the look. Keep moving. The others, three, nodded and all eyes rested on Minion, who had unstrapped the great ash bow from his back and was testing its pull. He picked out a single long black arrow, sighting it for accuracy and hesitated for a minute. Looking downward through the veiled covering of the trees to the hundreds of gnomes on the valley floor, suddenly he realised what, what was expected of him. He was to kill a man, not in battle or in fair combat, but from ambush, with stealth, and that man would never have a chance. He knew instinctively that he could not do it, that he was not the seasoned fighter that Balinor was, that he did not have the cold determination of Hendel. He was brash and even brave at times, and ready to stand against anyone in open combat, but he was not a killer. He glanced back momentarily at the others, and they saw it at once in his eyes. You must do it, whispered Balinor harshly, his eyes burning with fierce determination. Juran's face was averted slightly in the half-light, Grim, frozen with uncertainty, Dayal stared directly at Minion, his elven eyes wide, frightened by the choice the Highlander faced, the youthful countenance ashen and ghost-like. I, I cannot kill a man this way, Minion shook involuntarily at his own words, even to save their lives. He paused, and Balinor continued to stare at him, waiting for something more. I can do the job, Minion announced, suddenly after a moment's reflection and a second look to the valley below, but it shall be done in a different way. Without further explanation, he moved forward through the clump of trees and crashed silently on the fringe, almost beyond its sparse protection. His eyes scanned hurriedly the forms of the gnomes below, finally coming to rest on a chieftain on the far side of the path. The gnome stood before his subject, his wise and yellow face uplifted, his small hands extended, holding and offering a long bowl of glowing embers. He stood motionless as he led the chanting with the other gnome chieftains, his face turned toward the entrance to the wolf's cave. Minion withdrew a second arrow from the quiver and laid it in front of him. Then on one knee, he inched from the safety of the small tree he had positioned himself behind fitted the first arrow to the bow and sighted. The other three waited grimly, breathless, 
within the edges of the foliage watching the bowmen. For one split second, everything seemed to come to a complete standstill, and then the taut bowstring was released with an audible twang, and the arrow flew invisibly to its target. Almost as a part of the same motion, Minion fitted the second arrow to the string, sighted and fired with him blinding rapidity, then dropped motionless into the cover of the closest street. It happened so fast that no one saw it at all, but each caught glimpses of the bowman's actions and the scene that followed in the midst of the unsuspecting gnomes. The first arrow struck the long bowl in the outstretched hands of the chanting chieftain and sent it spinning in an explosion of wood splinters. Gleaming red coals flew apart upward in a shower of sparks, and the next instant, while the astonished gnome and his still mystified followers were caught momentarily frozen with uncertainty, the second arrow embedded itself painfully in the half turn and highly vulnerable posterior of the chieftain, who gave an agonizing howl that it could be heard the length and breadth of the pilot passage aid. The timing was absolutely perfect. It happened so quickly that even the unfortunate victim had no time nor inclination for that matter, to decide where the embarrassing assault had come from, or the deceitful perpetrator might have been. The known chieftain leaped up in terror and, and pain for several wild moments as his fellow gnomes looked in a mixed bewilderment and apprehension. Emotions that quickly changed. The ceremony had been rudely interrupted, and one of the chieftains had been treacherously struck from ambush. They were humiliated and dangerously angered. Within seconds after the arrows struck their targets, before anyone had been given a chance to collect his senses, a torch appeared far away inside the pass on the upper reaches of the northern slope, touching off a giant bonfire that blazed the night sky as if the earth itself had erupted in an answer to the cries of the vengeful gnomes. Before the rising blaze, stood the broad immobile figure of the dwarf Hendel, his arms raised in challenge, one great hand clutching the stone shattering mace, menacing defiance of all who looked up at him. His laugh echoed deafeningly off the cliff walls. Come face me, gnomes, worms of the earth, he roared mockingly. Stand and fight! It's plain you won't be caught sitting for a while. Your foolish gods cannot save you from the powers of a dwarf, let alone the spirits of the wolf's gang. The roar of fury went up from the gnomes, was frightening, almost to a man. They surged forward into the pass of Jack to reach the mocking figure on the slope above. Determined to tear his heart out for the shame and humiliation inflicted upon them, to strike a gnome chieftain was bad enough, but to insult their religion and their courage in the same breath was unforgivable. Some of the gnomes recognized the dwarf immediately and shouted his name to the others, crying out for his instant death as the gnomes charged blindly ahead into the path, their ceremony forgotten, the fires burning untended. The four men on the slope leaped to their feet, clutching tightly the stretches of their precious cargo, and raced in a low crouch across the open and unprotected slope. Fully exposed by the glare of the blaze below, their shadows appearing as huge phantoms against the cliffside above their fleeting form. No one paused to check the progress of the angered gnome. They charged madly ahead. Eyes glued to the sheltering blackness of the Anar forest looming in the distance. Miraculously, they made it to the safety of the forest. There they paused, breathing heavily in the cool shadows of the great trees, listening to the sounds in the pass. Below them, the floor of the pass entrance was deserted, except for a small cluster of gnomes, one of whom was engaged in aiding the wounded chieftain by extracting the painful arrow. Minion chuckled inwardly at the sight, a slow smile spreading over his lean face. It quickly vanished, however, as he looked up into the pass, where the bonfire on the northern slope still burned fiercely. The maddened gnomes were climbing upward from all directions. 
an endless number of small yellowish bodies, the foremost of which had almost reached the blaze. There was no sign of Hendel, but from all appearance he was trapped somewhere on the slope. The four watched for only a minute, then Balinor silently signalled for them to move out. The pass of Jade was left behind. It was dark in the heavy forest once the company had gone beyond the light of the gnome fire. Balinor placed the Prince of Lee and the four with instructions to move downward from the southern slope to find a trail that would take them west. It did not take long to reach such a trail and the little band moved into the central Anar. The forest about them shut out most of the dim light of the distant stars and the great trees framed the path ahead like black wool. The Valmum was thrashing violently on the stretches again and moaning painfully. Even through the heavy gags, the carriers were beginning to lose hope for their young friends. The poison was seeping slowly through their system, and when enough of it reached their hearts, the end would come abruptly. There was no way the four men could know how much time was left. The brothers had no way to estimate how far they might be from any sort of medical assistance. The one man who knew the central Anar was behind them, trapped in the wolf's gate and fighting for his life. Suddenly, so quickly that the four had no time to get off the trail to avoid detection, a group of gnomes appeared from out of the wall of trees on the path ahead. For a moment, everyone stood motionless, each group squinting through the dim light. It only took an instant for each to realise who the other was. The four men quickly put down the cumbersome stretches and moved forward to stand in a line across the trail. The gnomes, numbering ten or twelve in all, clustered together for a moment, and then one of them disappeared back into the trees. Ah, the sample help, Eleanor whispered to the others. We don't get them by quickly. They will have reinforcements here to finish us off. He had barely gotten the words out of his mouth before the remaining gnomes let out a chilling battle cry and charged toward the fort, their short, wicked-looking swords gleaming dully. The silent arrows of Minion and the Elf Brothers dropped three of them in mid-stride before the rest swarmed over them like savage wolves. Dayel was completely bowled over by the assault and for a moment was lost from sight to the rear. Balinor stood firm as a huge blade cut two of the unfortunate gnomes in half with one great sweep. The next several minutes were filled with sharp cries and laboured breathing as the fighters battled back and forth across the narrow trail. The gnomes seeking to get under the long reach of the men before them, the four defenders manoeuvring to keep themselves between the fierce attackers and to their injured companions. In the end, the gnomes all lay dead on the bloody trail their bodies small heaps in the dim light of the watching stars. They all had received a serious slash in the ribs and had to be bound. And Minion and Durin had received a number of small wounds. Balinor was untouched, his body protected from the gnome swords by the lightweight chain mail beneath his shredded cloak. The four paused only long enough to bind up Dayal's rib before picking up the stretchers and continuing at an even faster pace along the deserted path. They had further reason to hasten now. Gnome hunters would be quickly on their trail once they found their slain comrades. Many had tried to guess the hour from the position of the star, and by estimating their time of travel since the sun had set back in the Wolfsgate Mountains, but could only conclude it was somewhere in the early morning hours. The Highlander felt fatal final signs of fatigue began to creep through his aching arms and strain back muscles as he walked rapidly behind the broad form of Balinor, who had taken the lead. They were all close to exhaustion, their bodies worn from the day's travel and their encounters with first the monster and the wolf gang and then the gnomes. They were kept on their feet primarily because they knew what would happen to the Valmen if they stopped. Nevertheless, thirty minutes after the brief battle with the gnome rearguard, they all simply collapsed in mid-strike from the loss of blood and exhaustion. 
took the other civil minister to revive him and get him back on his feet. Even then, the pace slowed noticeably. Eleanor was forced to call a second halt only minutes later to allow them all a much needed rest. They huddled quietly at the side of the trail and listened in dismay to the growing tumult all about them. Shouting and muffled drum, still distant, had begun again since their encounter on the trail. Apparently the gnomes were alerted sufficiently to the presence they have called out a large number of hunting parties to track them down. It sounded as if the entire Anar forest were alive with angered gnomes, stalking the surrounding woods and hills in an effort to find the enemy they had slipped by them on the trail and killed ten or so of their number in avoiding capture. Minion glanced down wearily at the young Velmer, their faces white and covered with a heavy sheen of perspiration. He could hear them moaning through the cloth, see their limbs convulse as the poison seep relentlessly through their failing systems. He looked at them and felt suddenly that he had somehow let them down when they needed him most, and that now they would pay the price for his failure. It angered him when he thought about the whole crazy idea of journeying to Baronor to retrieve a relic of another age on the offhand chance that it would save them, or save anyone for that matter, from a creature like the Warlock Lord. Yet he knew, even as he finished the thought, that it was wrong to question now something they had accepted from the first there's little more than a remote possibility. He looked at Flick wearily and wondered why they couldn't have been better friends. During a sudden whisper of warning sent them all scurrying off the exposed path with the cumbersome stretches to seclusions of the great trees, flattening themselves against the earth and waiting breathlessly. A moment later, the distinct sound of heavy boots reverberated along the deserted trail. And from the direction in which they had come, a party of no warriors marched out of the darkness toward their hiding place. Balinor immediately knew there were too many for them to fight, and placed a restraining hand on the excited minion to keep them from making any sudden movement. The gnomes marched along the trail in formation, the yellow faces stony in the starlight as their wide set eyes glanced uneasily about in the dark forest. They reached the point where the company cracked and hiding and moved on up the trail without pausing, unaware that their quarry was within a few feet. When they had disappeared from sight and there was no further sound of minion turned to Balinor. We are finished if we don't find Alanon. We won't get another mile carrying Shay and Flick under these conditions unless we have help. Balinor nodded slowly, but made no comment. He knew their situation, but he knew as well that stopping now would be worse than capture or second encounter with the gnome. They could leave the brothers in these woods and hope that they could find them after they got help. It was clearly too great a risk. He motioned the others to their feet. Without speaking, they picked up the stretches and resumed the weary march along the forest path knowing now that the gnomes were in front of them as well as behind. Minion wondered again what had befallen the, gal the gallant handle. It seemed impossible that even the resourceful dwarf, with all his skill in mountain fighting, could have managed to evade those enraged gnomes for any length of time. In any event, the dwarf could not be in much worse shape than they were. Wandering about there now with wounded men and no help in sight, if the gnomes did find them again before they reached the safety, Minion had a little doubt as this to the outcome. Again, during sharp ears picked up the sound of approaching feet and everyone leaped to the safety of the great tree. But they had barely gotten clear of the open trail and flattened themselves amidst the brush of the forest when figures appeared through the trees ahead. Even in the faint light of stars, during sharp eyes immediately picked out the leader of a small party as a giant of a man, cloaked in a long black robe, wound loosely about his lean body. A moment later, the others saw him as well. 
It was Al-Anon. But during sudden warning gesture, stifled the exclamations of relief that were forming on the lips of Balinor and Minion. They squinted through the darkness and saw that the small white cloaked figures accompanying the historian were unmistakably known. <sighs> He's betrayed us, whispered Minion harshly, his hand instinctively reaching for the long hunting knife at his, be at his belt. No, wait a minute, ordered Balinor quickly, motioning them all to lie flat as the party came closer to their hiding spot. Elanon's tall figure approached slowly along the trail in no apparent hurry. The deep set eyes turned straight ahead as he walked. His dark brow was furrowed in concentration. Minion knew instinctively that they would be found in tense muscles for the leap onto the trail where his first blow would destroy the traitor. He knew that he would have no second chance. The white guard known followed their leader dutifully not marching in any particular order as they shuffled along in apparent disinterest. Suddenly Alanon halted and looked around in startled realisation, as if sensing their presence. Minion prepared to spring, but a heavy hand grasped his shoulder, holding him firmly against the earth. Alanor, called the tall wanderer evenly, moving neither forward nor to either side as he looked about expectantly. Release me, demanded Minion furiously of the Prince of Callahorn. They have no weapon, Balanor's voice cut through his anger, causing him to scan again the white-robed gnomes at the tall man's side. There were no weapons visible. Balanor stood, stood up slowly and advanced into the clearing. His great sword gripped tightly in one hand. Minion was right behind him, noting the lean figure of Durin just within the tree. An arrow fitted to his bow in readiness. Alanon came forward with a sigh of relief and reached for Balinor's hand, stopping quickly as he saw the faint distrust mirrored in the borderman's eyes and the outright bitterness registered on the face of the Highlander. He seemed baffled for a moment and then looked back suddenly at the small figures standing motionless behind him. No, it's all right, he exclaimed hastily. These are friends. They have no weapons and no hatred toward you. They are healers, physicians. For a moment, no one moved. Then Balinor sheathed the great sword and took Alanine's extended hand in welcome. Minion followed too, still distrustful of the gnomes waiting up the trail. Now tell me what has happened, ordered Alanon, once again in command of the weary company. Where are the others? Quickly Balanor recounted what had befallen them in the wolf gate. The incorrect choice of the trail at the fort, the battle that had followed with the creature in the city ruins, their journey to the pass the plan that had gotten them past the assembled gnomes. Upon hearing of the Valman's injuries, Alanon immediately spoke to the gnomes who had accompanied him, informing the suspicion of Minion that they could treat the wounds his friends had incurred. Alanon continued his tale while the white-robed gnomes hastened to the side of the injured Valman and hovered over them in obvious concern, applying a liquid from solid vials they were carried. Minion looked on anxiously, wondering to himself why these gnomes were any different from the rest. As Balinor concluded, Alanon shook his head in disgust. Ah, it was my fault, my miscalculation, he muttered angrily. I was looking too far ahead in the journey, not watching closely enough for immediate dangers. Those two men die, this whole troop will have been for nothing. He spoke again to the scurrying gnomes, and one of them departed at a hasty walk up the trail toward the pass of Jade. I sent one of them back to see what he could learn about Hendel. If anything has happened to him, I'll be the only one to blame. He ordered the gnome physicians to pick up the Valmont, 
and the whole group moved back onto the trail, heading westward. The stretcher bearers in the lead, the weary members of the company trailing behind. Dale's rib wound had been attended to, and he was able to walk without assistance. As the company travelled along the deserted trail, Eleanor explained to them why they would not encounter gnome hunting parties in this region. We are approaching the land of the storms. These gnomes that came with me, he informed them. They are healers, separate from the rest of the gnome nation and all other nations, dedicated to helping those in need of sanctuary or medical aid. They go in themselves, live apart from the petty bickerings of other nations, something most men could never manage to do. Everyone in this part of the world respects and honours them. Their land, which we will enter soon, is called Stola. It is hallowed ground that no no gnome hunting party would dare to cross into, unless invited. You may rest assured that invitations are at a premium this night. He went on to explain that he had been a friend to these harmless people for many years, sharing their secrets, living with them for as long as several months at a time. The stores could be counted on. He guaranteed Minion to cure whatever might be wrong with the young Valman. They were the foremost healers in the world. And it was no accident that they had come along with the historian when he had returned through the Anar to meet the company at the Path of Jade. Hearing of the strange events that had taken place from a frightened gnome runner he had encountered on the trail at the edge of Storlock, who believed the spirits of the Tabu land had sallied forth to consume them all. He had asked the stores to come with him in search of his friends, fearing that they might have sustained injuries at the past. I had no idea that the creature whose presence I detected in that valley in the wolf's cave would have the intelligence to remove the trail markers after I had passed, he admitted angrily. I should have suspected, though, and left other signs to be certain that you bypassed that place. Worse still, I passed right through the path of jade in the early afternoon without realising that the gnomes would be gathering that evening for the purging of the mountain spirits. It appears I have failed you badly. We were all at fault, declared Balinor, although Minion, listening silently from the other side, was not so willing to believe he was right. Had we all been more alert, none of this would have happened. What matters is curing Shay and Flick and trying to do something about Hendel before the gnome hunting parties find him. They walked on in silence for a while, dejected men too tired to think further on the matter, concentrating only to putting one foot in front of the next until they reached the promised safety of the store village. The trail seemed to white endlessly through the trees of the Anar forest, and after a while, the four lost all sense of time and place. Their minds dulled into sleepless exhaustion. The night slowly passed away, and finally the first tinges of the dawn's light appeared unexpectedly on the eastern horizon. Still, they had not reached their destination. It was an hour later when they finally saw the light of night fires burning in the store village, reflecting off the trees encircling the tired travellers. All at once, they were in the village, surrounded by ghost-like stores, wrapped in the same white cloaks, looking at the men with sad, unblinking expressions as they helped the exhausted travellers into the shelter of one of the low buildings. Once within, the members of the company collapsed wordlessly on the soft beds provided, too tired to wash or even undress. All were asleep in seconds, except for Minion Lee whose high-strung temperament fought back the clutches of soothing sleep long enough to allow his bleary eyes to search silently about the room for Eleanor. 
Upon not finding him, he rose sluggishly from the softness of the bed and stumbled wearily to the closed wooden door, which he dimly recalled led to a second room beyond. Leaning heavily against the door, his ear pressed closely to the crack in the jam. He listened to the snatches of conversation between the historian and the story. In a daze of half-sleep, he heard a brief digression concerning Shay and Flick. The strange little people felt that the Valman would recover with the rest and special medication. Then abruptly a door beyond opened to admit several people, and their voices blended meaninglessly in exclamations and dismay and shock. Eleanor's deep voice cut through an icy clearness. What have you discovered? he demanded. It is a, as bad as we feared. <laughs> they caught somebody in the mountains, came the timid answer. It was impossible to tell who it was, or even what it was. By the time they were finished, they tore him to pieces. <laughs> Handel, stunned, even in his exhausted condition, the Highlander pushed himself upright and stumbled back to his waiting bed, unable to believe he had heard them correctly. Deep within him, a great empty space opened. Helpless tears of anger welled up, unable to reach his still dry eyes, and hung poised there until the Prince of Lee finally dropped off into a comforting sleep.